Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host. Glad you could join me. I can assure you, you will learn something about dog training, about your own dog, and about yourself today. We have bird dog royalty in the house. Ronnie Smith and Susanna Love will be joining us. Yeah, that Smith, that philosophy, all of those insightful training methods and tactics. We'll be covering most of them today. Not as many as in their seminars, but we'll get you started on the right paw. It's exciting to have them back, and I'm really looking forward to this. I've been to some of the seminars. Ronnie and I talk regularly. To have Susanna with us this time around will be even more fun because, well, they're a team, and it will be interesting to see that dynamic evolve as well. We'll cover everything from the history of the the Smith method, if you will, to their contemporary philosophy of dog training, a little bit of the insights and uh, personal details that make life so much more interesting. And uh, we'll cover it all with the folks who live it every day. You will be a better dog trainer when we are done. That's not all. We go to the Upland Nation Glossary, letter O, and you will suggest some of the other names for game birds. Well, at least some of the names we can share on a family show. It's all coming up as well as, well, a little bit of everything. You know, we'll talk this and that in a public access spot coming up in just a moment. So just hang loose. Well, if you're following what Flick and I are doing out there, it's all about steadiness. And now slamming the point the moment he enters the scent cone and all those things are going just great but as a result of all of that i wanted to share something it just hit me a few days ago uh he was looking at me and i was looking at him we tried to have coffee together no he has decaf but uh, we tried to have coffee together first thing in the morning when it's still quiet and you can watch the birds start coming into the feeders and um it, it made me think that uh, more than any of the other four dogs I have, and, and check me on this, maybe you're in the same place or hoping to be or have been in the past, more than with any of my other four previous wire hairs, I found that the more we train together and the more success we have while training together, it seems like the bond becomes stronger and stronger. Sure, it's easy. It's like a, you know, it's like an ocean cruise. You're having a good time all the time. Of course, everybody around you is going to be nicer or you think you're good. They're going to be nicer. Maybe they are. And, uh, you know, maybe that's it. It's just a perception. But I think it's beyond that. I think there's a chemistry there, literally and figuratively, and making a team uh, with Lots of positive bird contacts seems to be the catalyst for us. How about you? Maybe it's great retrieves. Maybe it's just being in beautiful places. All those things count. Flick is paying more attention in the field and at home. He seems to be more cooperative. And if you're in the NAVDA world, you know that's important. Probably, you know, important no matter where you are. But it is just one more bonus to training your dog on a regular basis. And, like I said, it's all about bird contact. And I think that is uh, you know, kind of the unspoken secret. Dogs think you are the bringer of birds. Of course, they're going to like you. We're made possible in part by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, and the Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota. Fire up the rig. We're headed for Susanville, California. I know. The People's Republic of California, but there are birds. And if you can negotiate the crazy firearms and ammunition laws down there, you might just find yourself in a quail and chucker hotbed. That's the BLM land north and east of Susanville, California. Yeah, it's way up there in the upper right-hand corner of the state. And... um, I'm lucky enough to get there fairly regularly from my central Oregon home. Good buddy and I try to make a pilgrimage every couple years down there. We're heading there again this season. I can't wait. It's bleak. It's barren. It's stark, high desert country. 
Maybe that's why the birds like it so much. We're talking valley quail and chuckers on that BLM land. So if you're looking for a place to go and you got one of those old-fashioned paper maps, which I love so much, look for the big yellow splotches near Susanville, California. Lace up your boots and enjoy yourself. They got all the amenities you need from great pizza to a Walmart where one year I had to buy new boots. Uh, I regretted that with every step the next day, but it was worth it. The farther you go from town, the better. Doesn't take a lot of work. You can cross onto the BLM property within 15 minutes of leaving Susanville. So if you're looking for a new place to go when you're somewhere in the West and it's kind of on the way, well, consider Susanville, California. You know, sageandbreaker.com is where you get notices of all the new products and all the specials, sales, if you will, if you just sign up for the mailing list. Gun care products crafted at the highest caliber. That's Fred Bohm's objective. And believe me, he does a pretty good job. He gives thought to everything he does, including, for example, his CLP. It's a liquid in a spray bottle, clean, lubricate, protect, It's also non-toxic. Yeah, if you're looking for an alternative to that funny smell from those other guys, CLP is the one for you. It cleans, it lubricates, it protects. And one of the ways it protects is it creates basically an anti-static barrier on all the metal parts of your gun. Learn more at sageandbreaker.com. And I just got my new pointer Acreus shotgun from LegacySports.com. It's in Cerakoted bronze finish. I'll be shooting a video with it tomorrow. Looking forward to that. It's a beautiful over and under, nice engraving, great fit and finish, and a heck of a great price as well. Take a look at the entire line online at LegacySports.com slash pointer. You can also order a hard copy of the 2022 catalog if you're so inclined. They've got a full line from semis to over and unders, youth guns, high-end entry-level target guns of all sorts, and many of them come with that Cerakote finish in three different colors, plus, of course, the traditional blued regular color. It's all at LegacySports.com slash pointer. So glad to have Ronnie back on the show, and this time joined by his lovely wife, Susanna Love. We'll be getting to them in just a moment, but let me just give a quick introduction before we start. Ronnie Smith Sr. started Ronnie Smith Kennels back in 56. Yeah, last century. Ronnie Jr. began running the kennel in 1982. I bet before that he was doing a lot of kennel cleaning over there. Spent much of his life guiding at uh, some of the bigger quail uh, operations in uh, Texas, including the 6666. They call it the four sixes these days. Mariposa and the King Ranch. You've heard of those. You've read of them. He was guiding folks like both President Bush. Yeah, Secretary of State James Baker and others as well, celebrities of all types. And if you recognize the Smith name at all, you probably recognize it first from his uncle, bird dog legend Delmar Smith, one of the founders of the Smith training method. Ronnie and his cousin Rick have refined it over the years, but it all started with Uncle Delmar back in the day. Ronnie Smith Kennels.com is you'll learn where you learn more about them. And if you haven't yet, crawl out from under your rock and buy the book Training Bird Dogs with Ronnie Smith Kennels, written by our friend of the podcast, Reed Bryant. Great pictures by Brian Grossenbacher. Brian, thanks for making me look so good sometimes in the magazines. Appreciate all of that. Susanna joined the operation a while back and has been training dogs alongside Ronnie since 2006. Well, I'm I'm just looking forward to getting deeper into that whole thing as much as anything else. So without further ado, welcome, Ronnie. Welcome, Susanna. Last time I talked with you, you were in transit from Big Cabin to Pawhuska. 
I'm hoping by now you've settled in there. Ronnie, how, how did that move go for you? Well, it was, uh, Scott, it was, it was different um, in that uh, I was 57 years old um, and had never moved. Now, I, I, I had, had loaded up and gone to, to hunting camps in Texas for many, many years for four months at a time, but I had never really moved. So it was a learning experience. I thought you could throw everything in a horse trailer and, and get it done that way, and, and we did, but it was, uh, I think, uh, it, it was more difficult than it needed to be. Man, I can could, I could sympathize with that. We, you know, we're, we want to move somewhere a little bit warmer for the wintertime, but looking at what we would have to pack up convinced me that we're not moving anywhere. <laughs> Susanna, yeah, you you've been around uh, various places from law school to uh, who knows what. I uh, plus you're you're a West Texas uh, 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 native, I think. What about you? I mean, all this stuff that you've never had to put in a box or put in a trailer or put in a can- kennel crate that must have been a challenge. Oh yeah, you know, every time you move, you uh, you have a lot more to do than you really think you do. Um, but it was it was a good move for us. Everything about this new property um, is just a better fit. So you know, when when you know you're doing the right thing, it makes all that that work and the process of moving so much easier. I bet. And we we were very fortunate in the place that we bought over here in Osage County. Um, the only thing that we really had to build were the kennels and the whelping room. Um, it, it really came together pretty nice for us. What was the, uh, you know, what was the, um, the biggest challenge about moving a lot of dogs besides? Oh, that was the easy part. Oh, the really? Dogs were used to moving. <laughs> yeah, that's all true. Dogs yeah. From Canada to Mexico, <laughs> that part were pros. At. <laughs> Yeah, I think when we actually moved the dogs over here, we uh, had a class in progress at Big Cabin, and um, I spent the night there, had dogs loaded. Ronnie and a crew of guys were spending the night over here in Osage County, and they headed to Big Cabin, got there about, I guess, 9 o'clock that morning. I had dogs loaded. We broke down the kennels, um, loaded them up on flatbeds, brought the dogs in the kennels all over in one one big trip, and had the dogs all in their new places by five o'clock that evening. <laughs> it wow, was pretty seamless. <laughs> How did they cope with that? I mean, again, they're probably used to uh, you know living in various places for various lengths of time. Ronnie, did you see any dogs that just couldn't quite figure it out? You know, there. I think. <clears throat> I think there are those dogs that that um, um, have a hard time with change, um, and, and those dogs obviously were were a little off center. But for the most part, um, uh, the dogs that we were working with and the dogs that we own, um, they adapt and and have quick bounce back. And it was just another day. Um, really, really was not uh, a problem. I think we moved fifty two dogs. Um, and, and that many kennels that day, it was, it was quite a, quite a deal. Oh, uh, I'm glad I wasn't available to help on that one. <laughs> I, I moved to piano once, uh, and I was on the downhill side of the piano when it came down the stairs faster than it mm. should have. So I, I, I stay away from moving anything anymore. Um, you know, the Smith name, of course, yeah, and I'm sorry, but it it really is kind of bird dog royalty, and I I understand maybe you're you know kind of tired of that, but it's absolutely true. You guys are you know the family name, the the methods are legendary. Can you just kind of summarize, without taking me to school for the whole seminar, which I hope to do again soon? Um, what is the basic philosophy? Um, you know it. Scott, that changes. Um, I mean, the the philosophy, the training philosophy is is we're, um, we're we're we really pay attention to the dog's mind because that's what you're training, um, and I think that's probably um, our our basic philosophy. I mean, we work in a very controlled environment. 
we build points for contact, you get a conditional response, and through repetition, that becomes learned behavior. Um, but it's really about the dog's mind. You know, I, I use a term, in fact, I used it for a book title a while back called What the Dogs Taught Me, because I, I think we're on the same track here. Uh, it is paying more attention to the dog than to most of the other aspects first. And I, granted, we got to do both, but, but is, is that a part of it, Susanna? Yeah, absolutely. You know, anytime you're training an animal, their their state of mind is paramount. You know, that that dictates what gets accomplished that day. And I think like Ronnie said, you know, that that is the core of our training program. We've got a basic curriculum, just like any school has basic curriculum that they follow teaching kids. We have that basic curriculum, but every every workout is slightly different, tailored to that dog's mindset. And I think that's one of the really neat things about you were talking about the Smith's family, Ronnie's family, um, being bird dog royalty. And I think it's really neat that after all the generations, the decades, the, the dogs that they've trained, you know, collectively, they're all very humble and genuine because it's not about the, the training format and the accolades as it is a, about the dog it's always simply about the dog and in creating that healthy minded adaptable proficient animal and uh it's really pretty neat to watch in action well um yeah another shameless plug for my book which is coming out in paperback any minute now actually but i opened it with a quote that i it turns out is roman graffiti the more people i meet the more i like my dogs it sounds like you all agree with that as well (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, um, it, yeah, I agree with that. But I tell you what we've learned, too, Scott, is uh, the, uh, the, the, the pandemic, the COVID that we just went through, um, you know, the, 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 the separation that um, we as, a, as well, the world, basically, but I'm just thinking about here in the United States, that's where we live, but the separation that we all experienced, the... Um, um, uh, our dogs did too. And Scott, there have been, it, it's getting better now. This is a the class that we have in place now is a, is a pretty darn good class. But the last two years, especially, um, uh, we have gotten a different kind of dog. We, Susanna is the one that dubbed it the COVID dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and it, it really has, we have been seeing a lot of, of, of dogs that, you know, kind of live in a neon world and, and uh, everything bothers them and, and, and cannot bounce back very quickly, if at all. Um, so, you know, things have, things have, have really changed and, and we see how it's affected a lot of children in the same way. So, you know, yeah, we, we like dogs. Um, we have a great job where you can go to the kennel and, and, uh, and have all those dogs slapping their sides with their tail, happy to see you. But, um, you know, they're, they're a reflection of us too. Oh, no doubt about it. You know, it, 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 there's a great book out there called the other end of the leash, which is all about what we do that goes right down that lead and affects mm-hmm. the dog. And, and, and granted it's a two way, it's a two way leash, I guess would mm-hmm. be the best way to put it, but it, it's absolutely true. Now, um, if I remember when we were arranging this interview, you were coming off a weekend seminar right there in Pawhuska. Uh, if you had to each take kind of one takeaway from that seminar and, you know, tell me what level it was. And, and if you had to just summarize your takeaway from the people and the dogs you were working with last weekend, what would it be? Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, I, I'm trying to, to run that back through my head. I think, I think the, the, I think the most difficult thing, um, that we see in, in the majority of the seminars are that, um, um, I'm not sure that, that, that everybody really knows the animal that's living in their house. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, we have this dog and, in uh, we, we love him and, and we, and we love on him and, um, uh, it can be very calming or not. Um, but, but I don't know that, 
that that everybody really knows knows the animal, um, and that's kind of uh, I think that's kind of where Susanna and I are this year is um, just trying to 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 bring an awareness of of this this domesticated predator that's living in your home. You know that I agree, and you know yeah. there's there's a growing theme, you know, since they do live in our home and we all love them so dearly. Um, the, the lines get blurred and, you know, people think of them as their children. And um, I, for one, think that's a disservice to the dogs because we have to keep that separation and keep in mind that they are canine and they have a different set of needs than our human family members. And we have to keep that in mind you know, as a population, as, as we live with these animals and hunt with these animals and, and just keep in mind that they are animals and it's our responsibility to treat them like animals so we can keep them healthy minded. Um, and it's, it's easy to cuddle up in bed with them and forget about all that. But I think that is our responsibility um, as, as dog owners to to honor that uh, i can't agree more i I used the term derogatorily in a piece i just sent off to a magazine uh, um about fur babies and uh, Mm. and while it probably means a lot of sincere real appreciation and love for an animal they're not human and Mm -hmm. and we forget and and most people frankly probably don't have a lot of experience with other animals so rather than think or focus thinking to the animal world they change their thinking to the human world does that make any sense to either of you absolutely you know we we learn how to interact with humans or animals based on our our knowledge and our own experiences and if you don't have much animal experience to draw from then you naturally you're going to draw from your interaction with humans so then you're going to treat your animals as humans as well and i think that's some a place where we could all improve how we we interact with our dogs and and try to learn from each dog and and be better canine communicators and i think that's part of what's addicting about our profession is there's there's so much more room for improvement, you know, where there's always something to learn about these dogs. Oh, I, I can't agree more. And, and Ronnie, you said something earlier that I want, I want to play off of along those lines. And that is, you know, I've, uh, I've talked and written about this subject a little bit. And, and one of the things that I'm amazed at is a lot of times you'll take your dog to a seminar or to a pro trainer, or even just at a NAVDA training day. And some of the more experienced trainers, they won't say anything. They won't. They won't offer up suggestions or anything for a while. They'll just look at the dog. They'll watch the dog, and they're they're observing things that we really ought to do a better job of observing. Uh, are there certain things that we can do to focus a little bit on that? Yeah, you know, if you if you really learn how to read your animal, if you really learn who who your animal is. Um, then um, it, it, um, you, you're not always behind in your training. You know, you're seeing <laughs> things before, before they happen, and, and it makes your, your timing better. That It makes the association of the training um, better. Um, you understand your, your, your animal better, the, 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 the shortfall, you know, the pitfall of, of things that he does then you don't get angry you know you 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 see it for what it really is Mm -hmm. i I was just reminded of that we're training here to be steady to wing shot and fall and uh, on covey rises especially and you know there is that point in every dog's point if you will where they they're looking good they're nice and steady and then they start rearing back just a little (laughs) You know, most of us were so bedazzled by the point, and then we're looking for the birds, and we're admi- we're talking to the camera, or we're doing whatever else we're doing. We're taking a picture for Instagram. We don't see that, and that is the tell. Are there other tells like that that we ought to just kind of maybe that yeah, take us to school on that without giving away too much? But what else can a dog teach us by us just observing their their movement or their lack of movement? Seuss. You want that? 
really talking about because again it goes back to the individual and they've all got their their own set of quirks if you will their own yeah. um habits and default behavior so you you have to study that individual and learn okay um you know when this dog is on a covey rise if that tail dips he's about to mm-hmm. launch mm-hmm. or um you know another dog they may start um, kind of sinking a little bit and, and watch the pattern. We call them defaults on, on a lot of these things. Um, but there's a lot of times when you can tell what a dog is going to do on birds when you go get him out of the kennel because they have a set way of handling that excitement. So if you watch your dog in every facet of life, you, you'll start picking up on these little tells, and then you're more proficient in the bird field. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree more, and I love that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, when you were guiding a lot more, Ronnie, um, and some of the experiences you've had. By the way, I just read a great story about one of the old buckaroos over there at the Four Sixes. Um, maybe you met him in your career over there. His name was Boots, I think it was his first name. Yeah. <laughs> still still buckaroo in it, 90, I think. Um but but this is a fantastic guy. I, I'm not surprised. Well, you yeah, you're a Western uh, Texas gal. You you knew the Mariposa. You knew the four sixes. I'm sure. Uh, what was it about all of that? What what did you take away from guiding? Whether it's a, a a former president or just some schmo off the street with a big bank account, that we can translate to our dogs. I mean, you're talking about industrial strength guiding with a lot of dogs. What did we learn? What can we learn from all of that? Well, um, you know, the uh, I think that the conditions are, you know, got to, was, was forced enough to guide um, some really neat people in my life um, that, uh, you know, a, a small town, big cabin, Oklahoma boy, um, should never have had the, the opportunity to opportunity to meet but I did I think the thing that really resonated with me over the the course of, of, of four decades of guiding is that it, are the conditions um, Scott you know in South Texas uh, it, it's always hot um, so you you learn how to take care of those dogs you learn when sitting conditions are tough you learn that if if they're really laboring breathing out of their mouth uh, it makes scenting more difficult um, uh, you know the, the the topography, the variation in the ground. If you know a dog could wink, be hitting a high spot and and bounce 150, 200 yards over there, and the dog get birdie, and, and as he works forward, he hits that little depression and nothing, and then keeps working and ends up in the birds. They're just um, a, a, a lot of <laughs> there are so many things that can go on out there, so many variables that. Um, 40 years later, I realized that I don't know anything. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was in my 20s, uh, I, I would tell you everything that was going on out there, and I believed it with all of my heart. Um, but as you continue to do it, you realize that um, that those things that you thought um, were uh, a baseline are no longer a baseline. I mean, it's just you never know what – what you're going to experience out there boy it it, i can't agree more i i like to think i'm becoming wiser and wiser uh the more obsolete i become and (laughs) and and i think dogs are the ones who make that stuff more clear to us if you had to you know let's just get practical for a minute you learned a lot you're still learning uh in fact that's one of the things that uh that i that i took away from uh, i think Susanna said it first but you know you're constantly learning there's no such thing as being finished and i'll i never forget being told that by a master cello player back in the day (laughs) when i was a musician he's i i asked him the same thing i said you know now that you're a teacher and a performer well you know so so and so and so and so he says i'm i'm not i'm still a student and uh, i this is the guy he he made all the records he made all he did all the anyway you're still students as well what have you learned in the last week in that regard Mm -hmm. Susanna? well i don't know about the last week um i do think 
recently in the last couple of years, Ronnie and I both have really um, honed in on the things that really make a successful bird dog. You know, we, we take these dogs that we're living in the house with and, and we go on a long trip with them to say the Dakotas or, or, you know, maybe a preserve in the South, you know, whatever it is. We, we take them completely out of their normal routine and their normal environment and ask them to perform at a really high level. The thing that we keep going back to is the dogs need to have three things, basically. They need to have confidence, they need to be compliant to cues, and they need to have composure. Um, and, and it seems to me more and more everything that I do with the dogs goes back to that. In fact, we had a, a workout this morning where um, one of the dogs, he just, he couldn't stand the excitement anymore. He just forgot absolutely what he was doing. He lost that that composure. So then, you know, steps need to be taken to to kind of allow him to re-gear and reset in the field so that he can work dogs, I'm sorry, work birds more proficiently. Yeah. So I think we're always trying to figure out, um, you know, how to, how to better help the dogs and in those three things to me seem to become more and more important in my training well let's take that one because you're not alone everybody has that problem especially for dogs that don't travel near as much as yours and and i deal with it all i deal with it every morning because he thinks every time i put on a pair of boots we're going hunting so I have to mm-hmm. settle him, but is, is there, what did you do for that dog or what do you do for most dogs to settle them back down? Well, I think we all have to be aware of how our, our relationships and our bodies um, change the, the dog's mindset and, and the dog's performance. So we have a dog that spins out of control. We're always going to slow the tempo down, you know, whatever's going on, we're going to slow that tempo down and maybe have the dog just stand still for a minute and kind yeah. of gives with the bottom again. Uh, we may do a little bit of obedience. We may do a little bit of healing or something just to allow them to kind of regain control of their faculties for a little bit. Got it. Ronnie, uh, let's get a little bit more practical in, in, in regard to most of us who are amateur trainers and we're trying to muddle through our, our dog's uh, evolution to to the mastery of, of birds and, and being a bird hunter of all the things that you see when we come to seminars and uh, ask for your help in one way or another, what is the most common challenge you see? Yeah. You know, I think I, th- I I'm not sure that, that people, um, I'm not sure that people realize how much effect, they have on their dog Su- subtle just subtle behavior how it affects their dog um you you realize that a dog does not speak english sure we can teach them words we can teach them commands and but, but they don't understand the human language and they they communicate by observing right observing body um uh the the, the inflection in your voice, the inflection in your body movement, um, scent, smell that come out of your body. That's how they communicate. They really know us better than we know ourselves. And their level of communication is, um, I think, a more honest, a more true um, type of communication because it's it's for real. I mean, you're not you're not lying to them with words. You are who you are, and and I don't know that people um, are aware of their behavior and how it affects their dog. You know, if a, if a person is comes to a seminar and they're nervous and and you know they're afraid they're going to be judged, well, that like you said, that that goes right to your dog because he's he's studying you. You know, I have a a, a story that I tell that. Um, I, I get to fly a little bit going to seminars and, and I love, I love to fly. I love to take off. I love to land. I love to see the earth from above, but I'm afraid of heights. So as long as the, the flight is smooth, I'm having a ball, but as soon as there's turbulence, um, I'm, I'm pretty nervous. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to fall out of the sky. And 
So you can't you I look you can't look at the stewardess because they're professionals, right? You you can't trust them. So you, <laughs> you can't trust them. them. <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust them, man. They're pros. But you can trust the business guys, those guys that are reading the newspaper or looking at their computer, as long as they're still focused on what it is they're looking at, we're within normal operating range. Even though I'm nervous, they're letting me know that this is still within the realm of safety, right? If they start picking their head up and looking around, I know we're on the fringe. I mean, we're we're outside of normal operating range, and now I'm really nervous. So that's the that's the leader. That's the the, the kind of alpha um, that you've got to be in this dog's pack. Oh yes, yeah. you've got to you've got to be that leader that that is like Susanna said is composed, um, that has that impulse control, um, and and it helps your your animal, it helps your dog. Well, yeah, I'll never forget uh, the A and P mechanic I worked for who um, made us fly everything we fixed. And he said, any, any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. So bear that in mind <laughs> next time, Ronnie. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to tell you, it works. <laughs> oh, man, we're just getting warmed up around here at the Upland Nation podcast. That's Ronnie Smith and Susanna Love. Uh, if you don't know more about them, you want to learn more, go to RonnieSmithKennels.com. Lots of exciting things there from seminars to apprenticeships. We're going to try and cover all of that after a quick break. So stick around, everybody, because in addition to more Ronnie and Susanna, we're going to go to the Upland Nation Glossary, letter O. And then we're going to talk about the names you bestow upon all those game birds that fly away unscathed. Yeah, at least the ones that are okay for family podcasts. So stick around, Susanna, Ronnie, and all the rest of you as well. Right now, I would like to remind you that we are brought to you in part by AudioCardio.com. Yeah, kind of physical therapy for your ears. It's a it's an app. All you need is a phone and a pair of earbuds. You can test your hearing. Uh, you can improve your hearing with this kind of physical therapy that you just plug in your earbuds and go about your day. There's a 14-day free trial. If you like what you see, I mean here then you can subscribe for eight thirty three dollars a month. Watch the two-minute video at audiocardio.com. And if you had trouble hearing any of that, like I said, watch the two-minute video at audiocardio.com. And if you're looking for a new crate for your dog, we're talking hauling a bunch of dogs everywhere. How about design and engineering inspired by race car technology? Yeah roughlandkennels.com learn all about the rough flex energy dissipation technology that keeps your dog safer than those rigid double wall kennels learn why at roughlandkennels.com they're the pioneers in roto molded dog crates r-u-f-f rough land kennels right flicky rough yeah he agrees And welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast, Susanna Love and Ronnie Smith Jr. Uh, how 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 is this? The I got I'll call it the training season because that's where I am. It probably never ends for you two, but is there some seasonality to what you do? Yeah, we uh, you know we did the same the same thing um, for for many many years. We would we would take a a summer training class we would do two two classes back to back and then in two or three days we were in south texas or, or north texas they're on the four sixes guiding hunts for four months and then in two or three days we were um back home uh, uh doing seminars and, and training and Susanna and i are uh are trying to kind of uh, restructure our uh, our schedule so Presently, we're taking uh, training classes um, in spring. Right now, it's March, April, May, and uh, and then taking another class October, November, December, doing seminars during the summer. Um, but we're just trying to um, 
really trying to get out of the heat a little bit uh, here during the summer. Well, I don't blame you for that. I've been there and done that, and uh, I can understand completely. But um, there's there's also things that you have to do virtually daily with a string of dogs that big, client dogs in particular. Um, what are the fundamental goofs that we make on a day-to-day basis when we're trying to train our dogs to the to whatever level we think is appropriate? Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can do it. <laughs> I'd like well, to hear both both of your opinions. Sure. I, I'll bet they're different. Uh, Ronnie, go ahead. Yeah. You know, I think uh, I think something that, that we had a we had a Brit email one time that uh, that got sick and we had him in the house for, for quite a while getting him back, getting his feet back underneath him. He's a dog that we owned. And um, we're, you know, we're very rigid. We're very structured. Um, we're trainers. And I'll never forget. So protocol was is, is when you went to the door, the dog stood there, and you told him when he could go out, and he went out and emptied out. And when he came to the door, he stood there, and you, you invited him in. And, again, very structured. And I remember <laughs> – I remember I opened the door one day and, and he come flying through the door, slid across the, the bathroom, uh, I'm sorry, the kitchen floor, hit me in the knees, about knocked me down. I looked at Suzanne and I said, when did this start? And she looked at me and said, about six months ago. So <laughs> what, what really, what I took from that is that, um, is that when that dog is living in your home, uh, the, the lines are blurred. Uh, they they really become blurred, and and I think that uh, that has a tendency to undermine us when we go to the field. Um, and and two, a dog is a is a is a um, there's a social order within his group, and since he is in your home, he is he's a part of your group. And if you don't if you don't try to um, be the leader it's harder for the small children uh, because of their stature of their of their size but but if you don't always try to be the leader and, and make sure that those lines aren't blurred um, I, I think it, uh, it it's more difficult for the majority of people um, when they do go train you know for us being professional trainers the dogs are in the kennel and, and it's it's a job uh, we we go to the kennel and, and we we work on things and, and then that's that uh, they don't come home with us. So again, I think just being aware of, of he is watching those dogs are watching you every minute of every day and it matters. So, so tie true. that into, go ahead. Tie Susanna. that into um, just because the dog may have gotten it right the day before. They're not, they're not, programmed like a computer and and like Ronnie said you know you've got to constantly work on it and be aware of it working with an animal is is a constantly evolving process so it's never going to be the same thing and you can't work that dog that you had yesterday you've got to look at the animal that is beside you at that moment and look at his his state of mind at that moment and train that animal you know the day before may have gone perfect but then you know he came into the house and maybe um he and the kids uh kind of spun out of control maybe there was some tug of war with some toys at the house and so his retrieve is a little out of shape you know all those factors play into what the dog is like that you're working at that moment so i think that's another thing just to keep in mind um that you have to adjust your training to where your dog is yeah yeah absolutely i i got an assignment many many years ago from a big magazine that said all right so write a st- you only have 800 words which was the biggest challenge but you need you need to write it write a story that tells us what to do every month during a pup's first year mm. And I thought, you know, that'd make a pretty good book. No, it wouldn't, because there is no such thing as a, you know, a, a, a ironclad procedure through there. Mm-hmm. And you've just described that again, and it's absolutely true. Um, 
I want to jump over to maybe w one of the more defining factors of, of the way you all train. And that is just define for me, um, point of contact. Ronnie, you want to take a swing at that one? Um, sure. Uh, so point of contact is what we develop two points of contact on a dog, one on the neck and one on the flank. And the point of contact on the neck are for what we call the movement command. So we use that um, uh, for healing, quartering, and coming to us. So um, it is just a place that you can reference on that dog. It's lead work when you're on the neck and it's it's that point of contact that you can cue and get a condition response um, and then when you're at the onset of learned behavior then we can put a name to it it's here or heal or or pup or whatever you know direction change you want to call it the one on the flank is to just make a, da a dog stand still mm -hmm. and from that we can have him teach him woe on or another dog's point and steady him up on his game. So it's just a very consistent spot um, that we'll usually use the, um, the mechanical cue of a rope initially. And, uh, and then um, as time progresses and he reaches a higher level of proficiency, be able to use the remote cue of the e-collar to get mm -hmm. those same behaviors. Yeah. Now, yeah, you know, here's the, 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 the gist for me is always making the transition from, Let's just from the from a leash, if you will, from a from your um, from your command lead or anything else, to not having any physical contact with the dog the first time you cut them loose in the field. What have you done to lay the groundwork for that transition? Well, so let's let's just take. Um... Uh, let's take that point of contact on the flank. So once we've done all of our foundation work and we're able to put a, a training collar, knee collar around that dog's flank, and we can push a button, whatever level of intensity it takes, um, to whenever we can push the button and that dog stops, well, now, now we can go to the field with that dog. And if he gets um, out of pocket, um, we try to keep a dog at 10 and 2, um, to hunt in front of us, but if it's a dog that gets real lateral or wants to go behind, we can just push a button and stop that dog, keep walking the direction we want to go, call on him, and, and he will naturally come and go with you because of your movement. Um, he, he's a pack animal, and, and he's going to go with you. Um, so that's that's one application. I, I love that one because I'm working on that a little bit with my dog right now. He, he tends to want to... Uh... Number one, be distracted by all the chipmunks. Number two, get behind me a little bit more than I like. And and right now I'm using another couple methods that may or may not work. We'll find out. But you like to stop him and then bring him, call his attention to you again and then move off. Is that what I'm hearing? Right. We, we try to teach these dogs um, that when we're in the field to just go with us. Um, you know, you can, you can handle dogs back into the pocket, back in, into play. Mm -hmm. and, and we do, we do that. But our objective is to try to teach those dogs to just go with this. So it's, it, it's really very similar to having a dog on a long line or a chip cord. So if that dog cast laterally to one side or the other, you can cue him with, with that rope. And in, in doing so, you, you use that point of contact on his neck. And when you cue him, he looks at you, right? Yeah. From, from yeah. just stopping his momentum. And now you're walking a different direction. And pretty soon they start to associate that when they're cued to look towards you and come and go my direction, not, not come back to me, but just come and go my direction. And it's the same, uh, the, the, um, it's the same with the color. Um, on the flank. Sure. You stop that dog out there and then you call on him and he looks at you and you're walking the direction you want to go and, and he will come your way. We also teach a release um, so that we can release the dog too to, to expedite, to speed that, that process up, that release. You know, one thing. I tell you, for somebody that is a student of animal behavior, what Ronnie just described is really neat to watch in action. Yeah. Because when you stop those dogs, it allows them time to think. 
And they look where they want to go. They look where they know they're supposed to go. And you see them work through that, that process of deciding what they're going to do. And they'll always tell you exactly where they want to go. And when they move on, they're looking where they want to go or where they've decided to go. So that tells you if they're looking at you, they're coming back to the front and they're going to go hunt where you're heading. Um, they're going to make a good cast. But if they're looking over the horizon the other direction, then you've got to keep working on that until they make the right decision. So a lot of our training is structured to help those dogs make a good decision. So for us, it's really neat to watch that process of teaching them to handle. Well, that's a, that's part and parcel to what we talked about earlier that, you know, if we're watching those dogs more carefully than normally, instead of talking about yesterday's football game, a lot of that stuff just, it just kind of, you know, oozes over to you, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, in all the pictures and all the times I've seen you in person, I don't know that I've ever seen a whistle around anybody's neck. Is that a, is, is that a part of your, your training or handling philosophy or do you have better ideas there? Yeah, absolutely. We use whistles. Okay. Um, in part because if we've got a big running dog that yep. we need to talk to, mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to reach out there and, and get their attention. So yeah, we use whistles. We don't use a lot of, um, whistle or verbal communication with dogs because again our training format yeah. is yeah. is really designed to be quiet in the field so you don't have to talk to them all the time because you know after all the the end game is hunting and stealth is a part of hunting yeah. <laughs> so we want to be quiet in the field we don't want a lot of a lot of noise i am um, i'm uh, uh, to finally reminded of that one more time i'll blow i'll blow that off for another day but um what about younger dogs and praise what kind of forms of praise ronnie do you guys use out there is it food treats is it verbal is it all of that and more and uh, you know clue us in on that yeah um we are of the philosophy that whatever works works and yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's the truth you know you may have a, a dog that has real aversion to loading up and if it takes takes food to to um uh, motivate that dog to load then we're okay with that um uh the the praise part of it um you know if you can keep that all together, if a person is sharp enough to keep that all together, then um, uh, using treats in, in your voice, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But most people aren't able to separate that. Uh, a lot of that is for us. Um, so the, the thing I would encourage is um, what we do a lot of, uh, is is just try to keep our animal relaxed. You know, when we're when we're rubbing on a dog, it's not really to say, "Oh, you did a great job. What a good boy." It is it is just slow and methodical with pressure, just trying to rub on this animal, keep this animal um, relaxed and receptive. Um, as long as he's relaxed, his mind is receptive to input from us. Um, there are times when we change uh, inflection or in our voice if we make a handling correction when that dog turns and comes on back uh, the, the right direction our inflection will change that a boy you know and they'll pick up on that and then they learn where the pocket is um, but if you over over praise your dog a lot of times you over stimulate your dog so you can have a dog that maybe is healing and you stop and he and he's he's very compliant and you reach down and say oh what a good boy you rub on him now he bounces out of shape because you overstimulated his mind so now you have to make a leash correction putting back in position where something that you caused so you know I, again i think um it's okay to use whatever type of of of, of uh, uh praise that you want as long as you know what you're doing yeah, you know, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of, uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, who was known for well known for his excesses in his day, who said moderation in all things. 
including moderation. But that uh, he must have known <laughs> something I don't. But but I get it, and I've seen that in action, and I've been guilty of it as well. It is um, there's a fine line in there, and of course we all cross it way too often. But it seems to make so much sense if we would only just train ourselves a little bit better for that. What about finding a trainer? Now, you folks have a fascinating, and and I've been the beneficiary of this, a fascinating apprenticeship training program. So you're out there creating great trainers that train like you train all over the country. If we're looking beyond basically going to your website and asking you, if we're looking, if we're shopping for a trainer for our dog, what are the things we should look for beyond the fact that they studied with you? You know, I think one of the things that's important when you're trying to find a, a pro trainer to hand your dog over to, you you can be confident with their, their judgment because they're the ones that are going to be making the daily decisions on how your dog um, is trained. And you need to have the trust so that you don't feel the need to hover and you know, constantly be talking to your trainer. Hey, how's this going? How's that going? How's this going? Because he needs to feel like he has the ability and the the time to do what that dog needs. So I think trust is is paramount. Find somebody you trust and feel good about them making the day to day decisions with your dog. Um, find somebody that actually can tell you what their curriculum is with a dog so that they can say, okay, here's what we're going to do the first month. Here's what we're going to do the second month. Um, Here's what we expect at the end. And then be able to convey the training to you at the very end so that you can utilize that training. Because if there is is no um, transition work done to hand the dog back to the owner it can be like that training and it can be wonderful absolutely um, solid training that's done if the owner doesn't know how to enforce that training it's like it never took place Mm -hmm. so there there needs to be a handoff where the the owner's instructed on how to handle that individual and and it is going to take some time to get the owner to the level where the trainer was able to work that dog, um, you know, that level of proficiency, because there's a lot going on in those dogs' minds when they go through that transition of having somebody else handle them. They're trying to figure out, okay, do the old rules apply or do the new rules that I picked up at school, do they apply? And the dog's got to go through a lot. So the more information you can have from your trainer, the better off you're going to be. Ronnie, um, if, if, if you were to give us one, one bit of advice w- on day 49 or whatever day we actually take a pup, puppy home, and then for the next few weeks, wh- wh- what should we do more of and what should we do less of with a puppy? You know, um, on the, the puppies, and, and this, is, this is really Susanna's wheelhouse. I tell you, the job that she does with the pups is unbelievable. But what I... What, uh, what I have taken from it, she's taught me a lot about this, is, um, you know, when she goes, it, it's just, it, it, it's, it's socialization. Yeah. Um, those puppies that are well socialized, they, and that, that doesn't mean, you know, a dog that lives in your home is well socialized. It just means he lives in your home. <laughs> but those, those pups that, that get a lot of, of stimulation, a lot of input, a lot of interaction, a lot of different things. It, it makes them bulletproof. It makes those pups, um, where when they see, do see a situation, um, where it kind of sets them back on their heels, uh, they, they recover quickly and they're able to move forward. And then when it comes to training, uh, because there is stress in training, um, whether it's people being trained or animals, there's, there's stress involved with that. And, and those, those dogs that can mitigate that stress the best come out the best. So um, I think, you know, to encourage uh, people to take those puppies a lot of different places, uh, you know, don't make excuses for them. And then, um, 
you know, bring that prey drive uh, to a pinnacle if you can as they get a little bit older. Give them some exposure to the field. Uh, let that that inherent desire to to hunt um, be allowed to surface. And if you've got a well socialized animal, one that can mitigate um, pressure and stress, and a dog that has a high prey drive, um, you're well on your way to having a a good citizen living in your home and uh, and also a, a good partner in the field. I'm uh, constantly amazed at how many people do not introduce birds to their dogs until their dogs are, you know, four, eight, 12 months old. Is, is there a better way to do that, Susanna? Well, what we do, and I'm not saying what we do is always the best way, but what we do is we start introducing our puppies to birds when they're, you know, almost eight weeks old, we mm-hmm. like to do a little bit of imprinting then. Yeah. And and with a little puppy like that, you know, you have to you have to take precautions. You want to make sure that they don't get overwhelmed. You want to set them up for success. Um, so we may take, you know, a pigeon with tied wings or something, do a little soft intro, may get them on some some quail that maybe don't fly real good, um, and really just try to light that fire in them. And what we see is just presenting them periodically as they grow up, presenting them with the opportunity for bird contact. Um, There's going to be puppies that they're not going to make a whole lot of progress in the first few months of their life. You know, they may be six, seven, eight months old before it ever really, um, that, that switch flips in their minds and they develop that strong prey drive and that passion. But by presenting them with birds throughout their development, you're you're hoping to catch th- some windows of opportunity where, boy, a little bit of bird contact and they are on fire and they have a new purpose in life. Um, it really makes a long-term impact in how they develop as a bird dog. So we just like to keep putting birds in front of our young pups as they grow up. Um, you know, as they do get bigger, obviously we're going to make it a little bit more difficult for them. We're going to have uh, maybe Johnny House birds turn loose in the field where it's as real as it can possibly be, where they're going out and they're actually hunting individual birds that you know are not in a tip up, they're not in any kind of a restraint. Mm-hmm. And and learning those lessons, learning how to work scent, learning old scent, um, those are the lessons that really really help a dog to be a proficient bird finder later on in life. So, yeah, I think everything that you do with a young dog is setting them up for what they're going to be like as an older dog. So if they don't get that opportunity as a young puppy, they, they've got a lot of catch up to do if their first bird encounters when they're a year of age and they're at a, at a, trainers um, and they're about to start their formal training they've got a lot of catch up to do so yeah I think if we get them in the environment that we want them to hunt in we get them on the birds that we want them to hunt as an adult um, I think if we start preparing them as a as a puppy they're just more successful Ronnie I joke about it but you know people ask me all the time well I you know you have all this stuff you get on tv and then you carry all these other things in your vest but um, you're out there every day learning <laughs> that there are certain items of critical nature, gear, that uh, you can't live without as a trainer. Besides the ones we've talked about briefly, is there anything else on uh, on that list that we need to go out and get today? Well, you know, the four, I tell you, for us, um, we always have the, the wonder leader, the yeah. command lead with us. That's that's something because, you know, if if you get out there and, and your dog is injured, or you or you get out there and your dog gets hot, or or you're out there and he's lost his mind and you need to kind of compose him, um, uh, or or you just want to heal him back, it's that's the onset to a, a whole lot of behavior to just be able to have control uh, of that dog it on the short lead. Um, you know, you can teach your dog to settle. Um, you could heal him, um, teach him to heal. Uh, and, and that, again, is the onset to going with you in the field. The teaching him settles the onset to having composure and um, uh, impulse control when it comes to steadying steady them up on game. 
Um, I, I think that short command lead, and the reason I say that not just the lead, but the command lead is because for whatever reason, that, that contiguous piece of rope, um, it, it just, um, it, it just really, uh, it, it resonates to a dog. What it is, as long as you release it, if it's tight, then mm-hmm. they pull on it. But that cue release, the release is where they learn. Uh, it just really, um, it works very, very well. Yes, One sir. of the neat things, too, about the command lead is that the way we utilize it, it's it's always a loose lead unless we're making a cue. Mm-hmm. So the dog is not physically held by our side. They're having to make the mental decision to go with us. And that that is building a compliant mindset where they're, they're looking for um, cues so that they know what to do. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the command lead is you can get the dog more receptive because they have the autonomy of making that decision of what they're doing. And then when you turn them loose to hunt birds or do whatever, they're more likely to make the right decision on their own. You know, that is deeper psychology than anybody without a JD can ever get into. So <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but you're absolutely right. And I still have mine hung proudly in my training shed and I use it every day. Thank you, Ronnie, for that fine gift. Uh, last time I saw you over here. Um, uh, and if you don't know what a command lead or, or a wonder lead is, everybody go to Ronnie com and you'll find out. I'll, I'll describe it r- roughly as a r- almost rigid slip lead. Um, if you've ever been in the rodeo business, you know it as a pig and string, but it's a little bit more sophisticated than all of those things. And it seems to do the job better than anything else I've ever seen out there. You know, with that, we could keep going all day. Susanna Love, Ronnie Smith, uh, the Upland Nation podcast. Uh, we will do it again sometime. Next time I talk with you, we'll probably be over there at that place between here and Portland, Oregon. And I'll see you in person there. In the meanwhile, thank you both for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you, Thank you for having us on. And the rest of you, don't hesitate to stick around. We've got a lot more to cover here, and I'm looking forward to sharing, uh, well, a lot of things, including including your interpretation of bird names, especially the ones that are getting away from you at high speed, and the Upland Nation glossary, the letter O is on the agenda for today. But first, we're brought to you in part by Dr. Kim's Natural Performance Dog Food. That's D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. He's got a wide variety of formulations, no matter where your dog is in its age, its career, whether you need certain types of ingredients or you definitely do not want certain types of ingredients, check out all the formulations at D-R-T-I-M-S. Free delivery right to your door, 30% off your first order if you use the code UplandNation, D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. And if you're looking to outfit your own kit a little bit more, Not only does MidValleyClays.com have a shooting school and a great, incredible set of various clay target games to shoot, they've got gear, shooting-related apparel, vests, gloves, jackets, shirts, T-shirts, and hats, including some cool stuff that I've helped redesign back and forth over the years, from everybody like Beretta and Shooter King to Wild Hair and Browning, Shoot the Moon and Ms. Mac, variety of styles and prices and sizes so if you can't find it somewhere else maybe you ought to make a quick detour over to midvalleyclays.com all right time for the upland nation glossary we're on the letter o and if you have any more suggestions about any letter i'd love to see them go to any of the facebook pages wing shooting usa upland nation both of those are where i will take your suggestions as we continually update the upland nation glossary which is available in its current form at fee where is it available oh find bird hunting spots.com my god you'd think i would remember that anyway oh is the letter of the day o for open stake that's the big time field trials in which any dog has the opportunity to gain a qualification towards their title of field trial 
champion. That's FC if you've seen it on a pedigree or somebody's ad or whatever. FC, field trial champion. Open stake means any dog, any age, any ability level. Theoretically, it's the hot stuff. It's the top dogs who are competing at the open level. And I, I just love this, and I promise you we'll do more and more of it because it is so fun and so educational. I don't know what to call this segment yet, but it's basically going on to one or the other of our Facebook or Instagram pages and taking a, asking a question and then having you provide the answers. And in this case, we had about 50 different answers. The question was, Ditch Parrot is a pheasant. Tell us some of your best game bird names, curses, nicknames, or colloquial expressions. Man, the number was great. Todd Freeman says, pheasant is a wizard chicken. Okay, I love that one. Jeff Weiland says, swamp roosters. Yeah, we mostly hunt ringnecks on duck clubs and waterfowl refuges. I, I understand that. Lance, not only a great carver, but a great linguist frustrarian partridge oh i can't say that one on the air so i'll skip yours east coast uplander <laughs> david pennyquike says mountain chickens just a hundred thousand times more dumb than real chickens okay pheasant uh is the fancy chinese chicken at nancy buchholz kennel and uh let's see dennis milani says uh the woodcock can also be a timber doodle and a bog sucker absolutely matthew cherry says the rough grouse can also be a scrub chicken or a road bird yeah <laughs> his woodcock is also a chicken nugget with wings that's about right yeah um uh, let's see uh time for a couple more oh yeah travis hampton he calls chuckers satan's parakeet <laughs> That is so true. So true. Andrew Allen will will close with yours. He calls the uh, pheasant the ditch dragon. Absolutely, so good. Everybody, those are clever. I I I encourage you to keep keep coming up with more and then use them in the field this year. That's your practical assignment. Uh, yeah, go out and enjoy it. That part of the show brought to you in part by Huron, South Dakota, Ringneck Nation, HuntHuronSD.com. They've got anything that you need, starting with 124,000 acres of public access within an hour's drive of downtown, where I will be this October. Hope to see you there. You want more information about all the things you'll need to know from maps, discounts, coupons, travel information, the Ringneck Festival and Bird Dog Challenge. Get it all at HuntHuronSD.com. Thank you so much, those who have left ratings and reviews the last couple days. I sure appreciate it. And I thank all of our sponsors from Roughland Kennels to Sage and Breaker, Pointer Shotguns, Dr. Tim's, MidValleyClays.com, the Ringneck Nation, and Please take a look at FurFeathersFriends.com. Maybe we'll see you in here on South Dakota this season as well. Until we do see each other again, whether it's here or anywhere else, I hope to see you on the range. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening. <laughs>